have a quick video to show you first. The human eye is incredible. It contains 120 million photoreceptors. It can discern 10 million colors. It moves with a peak velocity of 900 degrees per second, which means if your eyes could roll, they'd roll three times per second. And it cicades, meaning it moves to when you read at using only 20 milliseconds. So it's an incredible organ. But it hasn't been since the, the medieval um, uh, times that we really have innovated on, on our eyes. I mean, our eyes really haven't evolved in, in a millennium. So except for, this, except for wearing these fashionable glasses, glasses were even fashionable back in medieval times. Um, but today I want to talk a little bit about what's happening uh, with our future eyes, with the evolution of eyes. Now, every big platform, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and 50 other startups are working on what I'm calling super sight. I recently tried one consumer pair of glasses uh, that are out from a company called North. They've raised over $200 million, um, and they, allow, they kind of look like normal glasses that you wouldn't be ashamed to wear every day. Uh, they have a Pico projector in the temple of arms of the glasses that can project things like messaging, calendar events, um, what to say to your wife so you, sound, so you're, uh, so you increase your, your uh, well, your chances, um, what song is playing, when the next Uber is coming. All of these things can be sort of cues or hints that are projected into your eyes. Um, you probably aren't willing to wear these to work. These are a developer um, model of something that has uh, what's called SLAM, which is cameras in the front of the glasses that can do simultaneous location and mapping of the world in front of you. And that really is what it takes in order to superimpose information or characters in the context of your environment. Um, now, the second big important part of SuperSight is not only the hardware, but it's also the deep learning technology, the AI that can figure out what you're looking at and can what, do what's called scene segmentation, which is they can, it can both pick apart different objects and also start labeling things. And this is going to be as, kind of as transformational as the web was for text. So when the web came out, text became clickable. Now if we can segment a scene, everything can become gesturable. We can, we can put verbs on anything. We can have a Wikipedia layer so you can interrogate objects. You can bookmark objects. You can see more video about objects or people. You can connect to things. So just think about it as like, this is the world of verbs laid on the physical world. So my, this presentation can sort of considers 10 benefits or 10 facets of how the world changes with SuperSight. I think the first one that's going to be profound is just the ability to have our eyes label and recognize everything around us. This means lots of things for cities. This means responsive lighting. It means emergency response drones. It means pervasive security. It means pre-crime services for minority reports. Um, these eyeballs are inside and outside every business today, and they're flying around and observing all these things and labeling things, and they will do the same for our own eyes. If you want to consider kind of a benign example of this, I really love this app called iNaturalist. Does anybody use it? 
It allows you to take pictures of the world around you and, uh, and label things that you see, mostly bugs and leaves and flora, fauna, things like that. Um, and I love the community aspect of this, which allows you to uh, see the best places to find you know, herons in my neighborhood in Brookline. There's a lot more, lot more labeling happening there. But once you have the world labeled and actionable, I think the second most profound change for Supersight will be how we move through the world. And I think this will have um, uh, kind of, it will mean we're no longer alone in our decisions and how we, and how we, and how we move. I think we'll have a shoulder, shoulders full of coaches that will be nudging us and guiding us and advising us through any situation. And these services will understand our affect, like this mood meter at MIT that looks at facial expressions of students in public places and tries to understand you know, whether people are more depressed during exam time, which they, which they certainly are. So this is kind of a, a, a quick framework for how to think about these planes of superimposition of data. Like there will be certainly planes that are, that are on, our, on our eye, close to our eye, contacts, certainly glasses, um, and certainly all the phones out there that can now do AR and iPads, but also think about these things as shared AR experiences, sort of planes of projection, like a backup camera in a car, or a windshield in a car, or a, um, a window in a high-end apartment, or in a business that can start projecting information over the, over the environment. And to kind of give you a, a, a view of the widest imagining of this, um, there's a project called CityScope at the Media Lab that allows city planners to use Legos and figure out where buildings should go to optimize walkability and access to amenities. So this is kind of, this is a data projection onto a physical model that helps people make better decisions and have these conversations. You know, another type of projection that we're start seeing is this mirror, which is called mirror, um, has a built-in coach to motivate your, your yoga practice. Or this startup, which is kind of like Peloton for rowing, has an Olympic rower that you mirror and you have a relationship as you row. So do you see in all of these examples, it's kind of, we're no longer alone in these experiences. We're only, always guided, mirrored, um, coached. And perhaps the most like creepy kind of coaching that I find is building neural nets that ha can make subjective judgments about the world. For example, what to wear every day, built into a mirror that's either at Uniqlo or in your home. Now, again, back to the glasses company where I work, at Warby Parker, we've been using the iPhone 10 capability to put a 40,000 pixel mesh on your face to unlock your phone. We've been also using that in order to sell more glasses, not AR glasses, but to also recommend the glasses that are most likely to fit your face. Um, so it's called Virtual Try-On. These are virtual glasses, you can't tell. Those are the real glasses that I'm wearing now, so the alignment is quite good. You almost can't tell which is which, which allows us to sell hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of more glasses. There's a huge ROI for this VTO, and Ikea and Wayfair and other furniture companies are seeing huge ROI for, for um, showing you what you look like. And Nike just came out with one last week, which I think is a little bit weird. Like, do the, do the, how do those shoes look on my feet? <laughs> well, kind of like the shoes on your, you know, <laughs> like your foot doesn't really shape the shoe in any meaningful way. Anyway, expect jewelry makers, watches, haircut salons, like anybody who, who's, who, who is putting, um, mapping something onto your body to be able to not only offer you advice of what you look like, but what the best haircut is, like our host has a really nice haircut. Um, so think about SuperSight is also helping, helping robots do many tasks in the factory. These are trickling down into the home um, and becoming safe enough with enough dexterity so you can trust these robots hanging out in your kitchen and cooking for your family. Um, less ambitious than robotic chefs, one of my students has launched an aeroponic pot for your pot, um, or whatever, lettuce, um, which, which embeds a camera in the, in the stalk, which perfectly 
cares for and has patience to look at your plants all day and just see if they're growing as, as, the, as expected. And they grow incredibly quickly under this, under this coaching, this, this tutelage. Um, this is real time. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> So kind of the fifth uh, facet of supersight is something we're reading about in the news almost weekly. Um, it's exceeding human ex experts at, at medical tasks. Um, MIT CSAIL, the Center for Computer, Computer Science, just announced this week that they can predict breast cancer from mammography better than human experts. They trained it on 60,000 tagged images, and now it's doing better. This was in the New York Times yesterday about um, lung cancer also being... Um, uh, an AI being much better than the humans, which will mean certainly things for, for jobs. Here's, one, here's a use case that I really like, and I'm an advisor to this company, this dermatology company, that helps um, people take, take pictures that they would be otherwise embarrassed to, to show to a doctor um, of their area, and um, you kind of want to get advice before you have to go into the doctor to see if you need a home testing kit um, or other application. <sighs> So the, the, the sixth sort of facet is, uh, I think there's this inevitable, interesting blending between work and games. Um, you know, Pokemon was the sensation that, you know, captivated most of us and had us walking tens of, uh, of thousands of steps a day in order to just find the Pikachu. Um, Minecraft just announced that they've just populated your world and my world with an entire Minecraft uh, uh, experience and um, that that you know is kind of all waiting for us. All we have to do is download the phone, download the app, and and start looking at it. So this these these gamification techniques of streaks and points and um, I think are coming very quickly to the world of work. And certainly they're breaking up the metaphors that we've lived with since the time of the pirates. We've always imagined maps are this planned view of, you know, find the treasure here. But now our nav in Google Maps is just follow the, follow the red fox, right? So it's totally breaking up sort of how we think about making decisions and doing tasks in the world. <clears throat> I've been wearing a camera just to, just to kind of hack my own, my own world um, for the last couple of years. And these are two days, one at the Media Lab at MIT, one in Copenhagen where I was working with a magician. Uh, he was teaching me a card trick right there. Um, we were doing a workshop on enchanted objects. And I think you know, this kind of helps reveal the, the kind of the future of work. Like, I should be getting points for not snacking, being outside, interacting with others, being empathetic to my students. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to kind of score all of this stuff that you're doing with computer vision. So, the question is, if all of these things are sensible through cameras that are worn or positioned in the environment or on our face, the question is, how will we get feedback about what we're doing? Will it really be reviewing a little flipbook at the end of the day? I think, no, I think it's going to be more ambient, more embedded in the environment. Um, I made a table to try to encourage conversational balance based on Susan Cain's book uh, called Quiet. Um, and here's a, a quick video about it. This is the balance table. It looks like an ordinary table, but there's something else important going on. Can you take it up a little bit? A conversation where everyone participates is a balanced conversation. Really the moment that you want people to realize that there isn't balance in a meeting is right during the meeting, and then people will adjust. There are introverts and extroverts, and you really want the introverts to share their ideas, because they often have the best ideas, but they're often just suppressed in an organization by the extroverts. So this is a real-time feedback device that helps everybody in the meeting see who's participating and who's not participating in the meeting. I'd be happy to print one of those for you if you're interested in, the, in the, this idea of continuous feedback in the environment. So the sort of seventh facet of Supersight is the one of industrial um, automation. Um, and uh, I have a, a brother-in-law, Ed, who's a New York City firefighter. And for all of the kind of weirdness and creepiness that I've just shown you of like how our world will be different if we're superimposing 
more information on our environment. I don't think anyone can argue that Ed, who risks his life every day saving people, should have the most current technology to show him um, uh, to show him things like um, where uh, to see through smoke, to show him a heat map of the of the of the building, and to have drones in the air that have the same capabilities that help him make better decisions every day. There's a company in Boston who I'm working with called PTC. Um, they make CAD CAM tools, and they have this nice product called Chalk, which allows for industrial co-presence, which is if you're on a job site and you have some thing you're trying to wire or fix, you might want the help of an expert who's, who's remote, and that expert has markup tools, one's called Chalk, um, that allows them to see through your eyes and to kind of, again, coach you and make you better at that task. Here's a, uh, a quick visualization of this. What's interesting to, about this is the, these marks can be persistent over not just your view, but anybody else who approaches that same situation. So they can be spatialized and persistent. And maybe, and there's sort of an interesting argument about, do you just see them if you work at the same company, or are they persistent for all time and for all people, and how messy see does the world get when it has mark, chalk marks everywhere. The other industrial one that I think is really compelling is, is collaboration. Now, we've been studying this a lot at the Media Lab, and kind of one of the big ideas um, from decades ago was the idea that if you're, in, if you're working with someone you, and doing some um, kind of ideation task, you really want to be in the same room for just only a couple of reasons, which is gesture and gaze vector. If you can see what somebody else is looking at and what they're interested in, and they can kind of say, well, what about that over there? It's a, it just completely changes the situation, and that's really hard to do if you don't have, if you can't see what they're seeing and what they're looking at. So this new startup, which is funded by Samsung and one of my former students, um, uh, is called Spatial, um, and they've, they're doing this across different types of um, head-worn displays or even a laptop. As if we were sitting next to each other, face to face. What if our creativity could burst to life in the space around us? Spatial is a collective computing environment that lets teams visualize their thoughts in the room around them. So whether you're on a desktop computer or scribbling notes on your phone, all your digital devices are seamlessly tied together into an infinite workspace. You can manifest your ideas before your eyes by just saying them and in a click, expand them with the power of all the world's information. Using augmented reality's infinite canvas, pixels become tactile, letting you manipulate them like... Again, I don't think the magic here is the infinite canvas. I think it's that other people can see what you're attending to, which is the important part. So the really the provocative future here around learning, I think, is really is what happens when education kind of leaps out of the classroom, becomes more ad hoc, becomes more just in time. Um, uh, and there are lots of examples of this. I think they get most powerful when you're not just seeing superimposition of labels on the world, but if you're exploring things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see, almost like going with Miss Frizzle on the magic school bus and getting really small or getting really big or getting really slow or getting really fast. Um, one example of this that I love is an AR elevator that's in the World Trade Center. And, and through a one minute climb to 102 floors up, you go from 1500 the year 1500 to present times. So you, as you, as you actually go up, you are seeing the, the crane shot, if you will, of the city, um, but also as the city is getting older and progressing from 1500 to modern times. Isn't that nice? I think there's a nice mapping between what you're actually in and what you're seeing, and seeing something you wouldn't ever be able to see even if it was a glass elevator. If you're into anatomy, who isn't into anatomy, I think um, this idea of also superimposing the, the beating heart, the lungs, the anatomy complex. system onto, onto the physical uh, body is also a power powerful idea for, for AR. Um, 
My daughter plays cello. This was a tough piece that she was working on last weekend. I know there's a company in the audience called Maestro that's building an app that has, uh, there you go, um, that has fantastic uh, capabilities. I hope it involves this. This was a, a tough part, um, but uh, I was able to take a picture of it and it was able to play this tough 16th note triplet part uh, just after taking a picture. So all with like a little bit of AR that helps sort of interpret the world, climb a learning curve that you wouldn't either be able to climb. Um, obviously this is interesting in museums to put skin on fish or animate the dinosaurs. Um, so one of the most profound downsides I think of AI is our self-driving future. Um, I know a lot of people are excited about this. I think this really will, as we've been modeling cities with self-driving, it mostly destroys the city. Um, the results will be cars that we don't really, um, where we don't care about the length of our commute. It means less density in cities and the rise of the exurbs um, and the exacerbation of traffic and congestion and global warming. Um, so, uh, you know, we work shouldn't be on the highway. We subsidize our highways um, in the, uh, but, but this, this is what will happen because the rent will be cheaper and it will be subsidized by the city. You know, the public peer is gonna be cheaper than an office. So when is all this happening? I've sort of given you 10 examples of what SuperSight means across different industries and for your life. Um, you know, think about owl eyes. Um, they're optimized for the largest possible aperture for night vision. They have elongated tubes so the eyes can't even move. It's the neck that has been uh, evolved and adapted to move. Um, so it took owls a long time to evolve. Like how fast will this be coming to your own eyes? Um, Obviously, it'll be evolve a lot faster than owls. There are 50 companies at least, including some of the most well-funded in the world, that are working on frames to enable this, this future. And infrastructure um, in terms of uh, cloud, wireless in terms of 5G, content companies like Niantic who are doing Pokemon, Microsoft with, with uh, 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 Minecraft, Wizards of... Um, uh, the, Anyway, all of these companies are trying very hard to make this the next big platform for computing and for interacting. interacting. I think your company should think about what does this mean for you and how are you going to get into this app store to remake the customer experience with SuperSight. Um, I'm looking at this company called Enreal. It's interesting because they're one of the first companies that are doing can, uh, can, uh, lenses that kind of look like you might wear them all day, um, that include this simultaneous location and mapping that have cameras embedded in them, that have a large field of views that are, that are um, uh, kind of light enough to wear all day. Uh, how many people saw this, this episode of uh, Black Mirror? Um, after a divorce, uh, he was blocked uh, and, and uh, he could no longer see his children or the photos of his children. Um, this is not augmented, this is diminished reality. I think this, this will be as big of a trend as augmented reality when we can block or, or substitute things that we don't wanna see for things that we wanna see, you know, homeless people for flowers or et cetera. So thank you for your attention. Um, uh, I'm really looking forward to, it, to what you think about the ramifications of this future of SuperSight. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. And I don't know if we have time for... Yes, we have one minute for Slido. Come back, come back, come hurry up. 57 seconds, 56 seconds. Why Google Glasses failed if this is the future? Why what? Why did Google Glasses fail if this is the future? Well, I think Google has just this week brought out their second version, which... Um, which wasn't really, uh, I would argue, it's not super sight, it's basically a floating screen that has no reference to the world in front of you. I think that's usable if, if you're on site, on a tower, using both hands and you need access to a manual. Um, uh, although you could probably just get like a clipboard and put it on your arm. Um, but I, I I, th I mean, I think it failed because one, it didn't do enough to, sup to have any sense of what you're seeing and what you're looking at. I write about this in my book. Um, you don't want a dumb screen that follows your head, which is what Google Glass does. You really want information superimposed on the world that you see around you and presented in the places 
where you care about it. And so it needs to know something about what you're looking at. So that's one. I think the other reason it failed was people didn't like the idea that they were being watched um, by your glasses and that sort of harmed the intimacy of conversation. That makes sense in a way, doesn't it? It's yeah. been a pleasure. The time's up. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Ciao. Thank you.